to get started the way we usually do, which is just to remind folks that this monthly webinar is a um, is a feature of the interoperability and technology uh, committee within ESIP. And uh, Ethan Davis, who's on the line, and myself are the co-chairs. And you know, this is the, the page for interoperability and technology. If you want to get on the mailing list, if you're not on the mailing list, if somebody just forwarded this information to you, you can join the email list here, and then you'll get notified of, of these monthly meetings. Um, and you can always you can go here to any of these uh, links and find a list of the previous meetings that we've had here. Um, and we and we are recording this meeting, and we, as we record uh, all meetings, and the recording link will become available after today's talk, as as well as the slides. And Lewis has already sent along his slides. I just need to connect them up here. So today, um, uh, actually, well, so so this is the list here. Um, today we have um, Lewis. Uh, and Kyo will talk about the uh, Akashi Open Climate Workbench, and this is kind of uh, the next in a series of talks on <laughs> on climate uh, models. Last time we heard about a community data analysis tool, so it'll be interesting to see um, compare and contrast those those different toolboxes. And next time we're going to be hearing about the EarthCube integration and test environment um, on October. 13th, the second Thursday of every month at 3 p.m. Eastern. So um, I'm happy to have uh, Lewis and Kyo with us today. Uh, I actually didn't know about this uh, project until a few months ago when we saw, I saw the announcement and it looked very interesting. So I um, selfishly thought, well, let's hear a little bit more about this. Um, and uh, luckily, uh, Lewis and Kyo are happy to oblige. So I'm going to turn it over to Lewis for the presentation. Um, and this is where you'll see the uh, the, the links uh, appearing for the recordings later. So I'm going to switch you over now. Um, and somebody's typing away. Hope, hopefully that's Lewis. <laughs> okay, okay. It's actually not me typing away. It's somebody else. All right. So whoever's typing away, let's see. We need to mute them. Uh, okay. That sounds I'll much mute. better. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay, though. Thanks very much, Rich. Um, and again, just um, a quick one here to say thanks very much for reaching out. Um, it was after we released uh, the Open Climate Workbench uh, community kind of released a uh, 1.10 uh, version recently, and we make the announcements to a number of um, mailing lists. So uh, just thanks very much for reaching out and giving us the opportunity to try and try and touch base with the ESIP community. I think that in the past we'd started more recently to, to post more of the um, release announcements and just features that have been added and stuff to various ESIP lists, but maybe we just hadn't reached um, the audience. But regardless, we're here today and Kyo, uh, Dr. Kyo Lee and myself are here today. Uh, very happy to be here. And Let's just dive in then about trying to support the objectives and what should hopefully these lead to, to, to people getting something from here today. Um, first and foremost, I'm going to kind of jump through bits and pieces about how the project came about and how it was transitioned into the foundational body of the Apache Software Foundation from uh, NASA JPL, how that kind of worked and justification and reasoning for doing that reasoning for doing that, moving the project into a more sustainable foundational body um, with uh, the possibility of opening up uh, contributions and use of the code base to a larger um, body than just internal to NASA JPL and our um, you know, various project partners and things like this. Um, I'll be going on here for maybe about 10 to 15 minutes and at that point uh, we'll see if there's any questions. If there are any questions in between, then please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, but if we could probably leave any verbal questions just till the, to the end, then, then that would be much better. Uh, because Kyo has got quite an interesting presentation about some actual science which has been done using the toolkit, which is um, essentially the interesting part about all of this. Uh, about after, so introduction of Apache Software Foundation, about, about uh, Open Client Workbench, documentation, wiki bits and pieces, and um, how people can get involved, and potentially anything that can be taken from this should be that 
Um, the mantra here is, is kind of community over code. Um, the reason that Open Client Workbench it has been and continues to be a more successful project is because we consider the community to be more important than the source code itself. This is a very um, um, pervasive um, attitude within particular this open source communities, but in particular within the Apache Software Foundation. Um, without active contributors, without people identifying issues and limitations, vulnerabilities, whatever, and without people contributing to a community aspect, then the code base itself doesn't really up to much if you're not pushing releases and things like this. So basically a guide to how you can get involved and hopefully um, take some of that stuff on board. And then, as I said, passing it over to um, Kyo to try and um, you know, give you some examples about how him, uh, how Kyo and his team and our team here at JPL have been um, using OCW in, in the real world and how many, many more people in workshops and um, you know, the climate community are, are beginning to realise the value of having toolkits for doing um, regional climate modelling activities. So a bit about myself. Um, I'm a data scientist at uh, NASA JPL in Pasadena. Um, I, prior to that, I've been involved in open source um, advocation and, and real participation for about a decade or so. Um, I basically enjoy just the community aspects of coding and um, I enjoyed participating in projects such as Lucene and Solar, uh, information retrieval technologies, but as I've been working alongside climate scientists such as Kyo, um, I started to get involved in the Open Climate Workbench and, and that's really why you know, I'm here today. Uh, my colleague uh, Kyo is a climate scientist at JPL. Um, he's a lead uh, developer on the RCMS, which is the Regional Climate Modeling and Evaluation System, um, which has been a project ongoing at, at JPL and um, in collaboration with a number of uh, institutions for a number of years. Um, and basically, that, that, that's an introduction to the two of us. And there's some email addresses there, should you wish to reach out to either one of us um, for anything that we're not able to answer in this session today. Uh, so we are the agenda, apart from what you're going to be taking away, this is just how things are going to be structured. Um, in particular, I would like to kind of place over the Apache Software Foundation stuff and, and go deeper into OCW because that's the, the point of today. Um, you know, the website where you can get stuff, information, what releases are, how you can get installed, get started. And then I'm just going to show you basically a, an example of how the, the toolkit could be used um, and then pass it on to Kill. So the Apache Software Foundation itself and, and really why um, we thought that it would be a good home for the Open Climate Workbench itself. Um, the mission of the Software Foundation is to provide so uh, software for the public good. And honestly, in a sentence, that's it. Um, it, it. It provides a foundational body to do that. Um, it pr provides a permissive license in order for people to consume and contribute towards that kind of software. Um, but within that, the context of that um, foundational body provides services and support for people to um, either take source code there or begin to develop source code in communities at the foundation. And that's exactly what happened in the case of Apache Open Climate Workbench, where there was an existing code base at JPL, and based upon understanding and doing some research into the foundational structure, the flexibility that the foundation offers and the potential to have a branded name associated with um, the OCW project uh, with the aim to try and grow community around it. it that, that, these are all very appealing things to um, essentially uh, small projects that, that are looking to try and um, create a sustainable vision for moving forward. A bit about the Apache group, where it came from and where it currently is today. Um, it all started really back in 1995 with a, a group, a small group of developers developing um, server-side uh, code that realised that there needed to be some kind of structure and they needed to start sharing code because they all needed to do the same type of thing. Um, that resulted in a number of releases. However, there was no real formality and there was no real organisation to what was going on. 
it's more or less just an informal collaboration until 1999, where the um, essentially the Software Foundation, Apache Software Foundation, was incorporated. And um, some details on that. They are part takeaway from this slide is that the, the foundation itself, and this is something that OCW has really benefited from by getting the word out through various communication channels, is that you end up if you invest in the community um, aspect of the project, is you actually end up with such a worldwide organisational structure and participation. Um, OCW, from having at one point um, essentially developers and some scientists at JPL and UCLA and various other places, we now have uh, committers and, and community members on that mailing list from around the globe, India, I mean, you name it, there's people that are becoming interested in it um, and, and continue to do so. And I think that the, the foundational body enables us to present even uh, at foundation conferences such as ApacheCon and stuff like this. Um, Apache today, what does it look like? Well, there's literally hundreds of projects. I think there's over about 160 odd projects. I've got stats at a later slide. Everything from small client libraries right up to server side infrastructure databases. Cassandra had to, you name it, um, to end user tools such as front end web um, client consuming libraries and um, absolutely everything. Um, there is no bias towards uh, particular communities and rather than picking the fast runner, we just go for, um, we, we don't go for it for, for example, um, the whole thing at one time. Uh, the foundation itself accepts projects that are looking to create sustainable communities and, and that's really it. And uh, enable that through formal mentoring processes through the Apache Incubator. Um, which basically guides projects through an incubation process through to top level project status. Um, and it's all done by volunteers, more or less, with the exception of some people who work within press and I think one or two full time infrastructure engineers that manage the global infrastructure and some personal admin, um, which essentially keep the um, foundation running. But it's, the important point is that there's no paid committers. A lot of this stuff is done by people um, outside of their maybe day-to-day -day activities, um, but nobody is actually paid um, by the foundation to work on source code. That entire model works through um, other people essentially being funded to do or on the usual, um, the usual scenario, which is that people end up doing this because they, they, they like doing it essentially. By numbers, uh, when I took these stats, there's about 161 top level projects, a huge amount of incubating projects as well, which are going through the, the mentorship process just now. And if anybody on here is considering or has been funded and currently have source code, which they're thinking about a more sustainable model for their projects, then these stats here are a very, very positive thing to, 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 to interpret in terms of thinking past, you know, maybe a next funding cycle or whatever, how can you you be developing code in a more sustainable manner, will these stats speak uh, leaps towards that? There's a whole body actually here involved in how do you accept contributions into your software project from outside? Well, the ICLA, this is Individual Contributor License Agreements, um, and there's an approaching 7,000 of these from people around the world, essentially defining a contract or an agreement, I should say, sorry, between how Code donations are made and it protects both the person that's donated as well as the project that receives donations of code. Um, so, what is Open Climate Workbench? Um, as I said, it was developed at NASA JPL predominantly um, and it's a Python climate tool toolkit for performing climate model evaluation and modeling outputs from a variety of different data sources. And these data sources are growing all the time. This summer, for example, um, I was working with a student from India on hooking up the physical oceanographic data at Ar Active Archive Center, the PODAC, one of NASA's, um, one of several of NASA's DAX data archive centers around the US, which serves phys physical oceanographic data. Um, as well as 
data sources from the Earth Science Grid Federation, very, very popular for the climate modelling domain, and a, a number of other efforts which are ongoing, and enables you to essentially do temporal and spatial scaling, uh, and capabilities for rebinning metrics computation and visualisation. Uh, and I'll show you an example, and Keo has, as I said, got some real, real interesting stuff on this. But I'll show you an example which is run from the terminal, which essentially creates some nice plots from some model input. And it gives you just a real quick glance at some of the power you can get from using a toolkit with a specific, a, a pretty well designed API um, that, that, that just gets some real power and flexibility to enable you to do some. So really, really cool um, metrics computation visualization at the end. So some things about the project characteristics about um, Apache Open Cloud Workbench. We have our project website, um, not managed by NASA JPL or anything like this. It's all hosted at the Apache Software Foundation under climate.apache.org. Um, program languages in Python, absolutely everything is run from, from Python language. We've got a log tracker, which is a Jira instance the link for which is available there, and we have community mailing lists, as I said, probably the most important part of the project itself is the mailing list. More or less everything happens on the developer mailing list, um, predominantly because uh, there's a bunch of development going on. Um, we've got new people coming there all the time, as asking questions, trying to get stuff fixed, um, potentially asking for new features, and as I said, throughout the summer there was two there was one Google Summer Project code, uh, Google Summer of Code project, which I mentioned, which was hooking up the Kodak data source. But there was another Google Summer of Code project, um, which happened through the summer, which was essentially to build a, a con continuous integration system round about the OCW components and to make them more easy to consume and easier to evaluate and assess project health, etc. And I'll show you all this kind of stuff. We have a public um, GitHub mirror. All the code is permissively licensed under the Apache software license for um, version 2.0. And that's basically available at github.com forward slash Apache, which is the organization for slash climate, which is the project. And most recently, which is where Rich and maybe a few others heard about OCW, was through our most recent release, which took place on the 27th of July, uh, which is 1.1.0 release. Um, since then, I think we've addressed around about another 25 to 30 issues, and I think we'll be aiming for another release maybe mid towards the end of this month. So, if you decide to pull the code base after or during this telecon or at some point in the future, then um, you, you would probably be pulling 1.1.0. However, that will be 1.2.0, probably, well, definitely by the end of the month, but maybe sooner. And you can do that in a number of ways, but you can download the source code from our downloads page, which is the bottom URL at that link. And I think the next slide I have was how to get involved. But what I want to first do is switch to just showing everybody a bit about first our website. As I've said here, we've got all details about the project updates. We've got how the project development is working and a bunch of documentation, as well as community links to the mailing list, project team, and how to get involved there. Um, going on to the code base itself, uh, as I said, it's hosted under GitHub. And we have here um, a number of indications about project health and stuff like this. How to install, if you're thinking about installing it, is to go ahead and if you use Conda as a package manager, and essentially, in order to get OCW installed, all you need to do is run this command here. That's hyperlinked directly from this page. So if you follow this install Conda, it's there. We're also on PyPy. Um, and there's a bunch of other things here which just indicate you know, how the build is working, one thing and another. Some information about getting started is essentially what you should follow after you've installed the code base. I'm not going to go through how to get started today, but I certainly will show you an example. And we've got a bunch of documentation, which I would like to go on to just now. So this is linked to from the website. And essentially, it's pretty comprehensive overview abstraction about how to use the API, but drilling down 
at a latter point into specific functions for how the OCW APIs go together. Um, similar to how NetCDF datasets do things, as people will be aware um, from within uh, the scientific community, is this concept of a dataset abstraction. And OCW is no different in that regard, where you load in data into this dataset container, and then we provide you with a bunch of um, functionality there, basically functions to operate over the data set. The data sources right now, based upon this, you can load in from a local data source, essentially like this. Um, anything that's within um, an open DAP server, we have a connector for that as well. So if you have open uh, sorry, data in Hyrax or, or something like that, then, then you can connect to that. The SGS nodes, which are dotted around as well, we can connect to them. You just require a open ID and your own password. So you log in via your account and you download data from wherever you want there. And finally, um, we have a data source which is hosted at NASA JPL, which is RCMED, the Regional Climate Modeling and Evaluation Database, which is essentially one of the backends for the project which TO is going to go and talk about, which is the Regional Climate Modeling and Evaluation System. We've just added to this the PODAC data source as well, which means that you can load in data from the Visual Oceanographic DAC, also hosted at NASA JPL. Once you've loaded in data, it's um, expected that you're, you're going to want to do some manipulations on that data set. So the data set processor module enables you to do that. Um, essentially what you can do is you can do subsetting, temporal rebinning, and a bunch of other um, processes there. We'll talk through some of these in use within the example which you're going to. And of course, I've mentioned that some of these are metrics computation is also included within the API. And for example, you might want to calculate a bias between two model models. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to do during the, the example. Finally, uh, handling evaluation is covered here, and we go on to do further some plotting and visualization, which we will cover further on. This year, the documentation itself can be navigated from the left-hand side here, so feel free to, to have a look at this. One of the things which, which would be really appreciated as well is that contributions and participation in something like OCW is driven on a lot simply by um, people identifying issues or something that they don't understand in documentation. So if you do find that you, you pull the code base after this um, webinar, then please, by all means, I think if you're reading through the documentation and there's something you don't get, either jump onto the mailing list and let us know, or else just log an issue in the issue tracker in JIRA, which is linked to from this presentation and from the front web page. Um, what I put up here was just a couple of the data sources that, that we pull from if you want to find other things, so you can navigate to podact.jpl.ask.gov and find data sets that might be relevant to, for some of the, the climate science that you're doing. Um, ESGF.llln, uh, Lawrence Livermore, Livermore um, National Laboratory, can, there's a bunch of data in here. You need to sign up for that and you can start to navigate some of the data sets they have in there. And of course, it's just opened up. That was just some links I thought I'd bring up to let people see um, the sources to go to for these, such as it's been recorded. Going back, however, to our repository, um, the code base, which is on GitHub. Oops. So if you navigate down to the examples directory in here, you'll see that we have a bunch of examples which you can just run. Um, the one that, that I'm going to show you here is this simple model-to-model -model bias, which is essentially the, um, it's like the word count it's the equivalent of word count for some of the more modern um, kind of processing tutorials that you go through. Simple to model to model bias enables us to, um, and you can look at the Python code later on, but essentially it enables us to load NetCDA files into OCW objects. Uh, we temporarily rebin data into annual time steps using the uh, dataset processor temporal rebinning functions for both datasets. We spatially regrid these data sets um, objects. Um, then we build metrics for the use in the evaluation. In this case, we use a bias 
metrics bias, which was on, of course, the documentation beforehand as well. And then we create an evaluation object. These are all just functions um, available directly from the OCW tool toolkit. And then we plot the results and create a nice um, visualization, which we which we look through. And what I have here is essentially that. So we can see everything running through here. Um, I've loaded in one data set, loaded in two data sets, the temporary rebin, calculate the spatial bounds, and the spatial resolution. We do the regridding of both data sets, and then we do the bias metric, and then we plot a small diagram which we can open. And we've got some uh, we've got some visualization here of the um, the the plotting itself. Keo is in much better position to to explain to you exactly what this has done. Not being a climate scientist myself, um, it's not my area of expertise, and I'm not going to explain exactly what this is. My intention is to just give an overview of really cool things that you can do to, to, to drill down into some nice visualizations from, you know, in this case, an SCDF data. And that there hopefully gives an overview of, of the type of stuff you can do with OCW, how to get involved in it, in the project itself. Um, going back to what we were talking about with the documentation, any construction contribution earns merit. As long as it, as it comes in, under permissive license, such as MIT or the Apache software license, that's great. Um, bug reporting and triage testing documentation and all sorts of other feedback that you can provide to the project is exactly what we're looking for. Um, and vice versa, this all goes into bundled releases which go out to the wider community. So these types of contribution are extremely important and given some contribution, what we, we love doing is building our formal community by inviting people to be official committers and or project uh, management committee members. And these invitations go out um, based upon merit in. Everything's merit based and merit does not expire. So um, contributions are, are, are really appreciated. Just a, a small plug here for some of the stuff that Q is going into to just try and transition. Because um, I'm coming up bang on my half past hour here. Is that um, RCMS, the Regional Client Modeling and Evaluation System, um, is a really, really good uh, example of how the underlying OCW toolkit can be used to drive on some, some really cool science. Um, for the tutorials that Keo and the team have put together, um, if you want to look over and above the examples that are present in the GitHub source code base for OCW, you can navigate to rcms.jpl.nas.gov and they've got a bunch of tutorials over there that um, show how the regional climate modeling evaluation system, the ecosystem, upon which is built on top of OCW. Um, there's some really cool tutorials over there as well. And that's me. Um, I would like to try and transition this over just now, Rich, over to you, Kyo, uh, if you're able to try and unmute and take it from here, that would be great. Yes. Thank, Thank you, Louis. Mm-hmm. Are you on your, can you share your screen now, Theo? Uh, yeah, uh, how can I share my screen with others? Okay. Uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, yeah, you, yep, you're now the presenter. Uh-huh. So you should be able to, yep, there we go. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, nice meeting you, everyone. Like my name is Kyo Lee, and same as Luis, I'm a data scientist at Jepro Project Lab in Pasadena. Today, uh, like uh, as a follow-up of Luis's uh, presentation, I'd like to briefly introduce JPL's Regional Climate Model Evaluation System, which is based on the uh, Open Climate Workbench library that Luis talked about. 
Yeah, before I start, I'd like to thank you uh, all for the uh, opportunity to give a talk here. Also, I'd like to thank everyone in the RCMES team listed here. And yeah, uh, just uh, my like quick thought about the uh, climate assessment. It is uh, almost like a needless to say that climate assessment is important at various scales. A core element of the climate assessment is evaluation of numerical climate models because our future projection under a changing climate wholly depends on the uh, model simulations. So climate e uh, model evaluation is highly valued, also highly valued in the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change report. And just uh, for those uh, who are not familiar with uh, climate models, yeah, both global and regional climate models are fundamental tools yeah, to study present and future climate. As you see here, the domain of a global climate model is the uh, entire globe. And however, the global climate model has a coarse uh, horizontal resolution due to its complexity and high computational expense. So lots of climate scientists also run a regional climate model for a limit, limited domain as described on the right hand side of the, uh, this slide. The main advantage of uh, this uh, regional climate model over uh, GCM is its high spatial resolution. And regional climate models are complementary to global climate models yeah, to study climate change. And application of our software, RCMES, focuses on evaluation of RCMs. Yeah, to demonstrate the value of yeah, high-resolution RCM simulations, there's an uh, international RCM intercomparison project called the yeah, Coordinated Regional Downscaling Experiment, CORDEX. Currently, there are 14 CORDEX domains around the world, and RCMES has supported the CORDEX yeah, RCM evaluations in many different domains yeah, and tries to become an official evaluation software for Cordex. So the recognizing the need to systematically evaluate RCMs, JPL and UCLA have developed the uh, RCMES and the main objectives of RCMS are first yeah, to make observation data sets yeah, for climate model evaluation to the RCM community, and oh yeah, to make the observation of, uh, to prepare observational data sets for the uh, RCM community and facilitate the evaluation process for regional climate models. And RCMS provides a quantitative. Uh, strengths and like a weakness uh, of models and improve our understanding of model uncertainties in future projections. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah it is uh, jointly developed uh, software by NASA JPL and UCLA and it is a Python based open source software powered by the uh, Apache OCW and you can get uh, obtain more information yeah once you visit uh, our website, yeah, it's rcmes.jpl.nasa.gov. And this slide uh, uh, shows the workflow of uh, climate model evaluation implemented by RCMES. Yeah, in general, the evaluation start with uh, loading observation and uh, model data sets, like uh, as you see on the left hand side uh, of the uh, schematic diagram, and once the data sets are loaded, RCMES regrid the data sets and calculate the model performance metrics and visualize the uh, research. And all of this model evaluation process is controlled by like a user input because RCMES captures uh, the entire workflow of model evaluation process another user can easily reproduce the same research using the captured workflow. 
on the RCMS website, you can find the, uh, more examples yeah, to reproduce the scientific research published in peer-reviewed journals by running RCMS and following the instructions. Yeah, some uh, our, one part one important part of the RCMS is like our own database. We provide I mean some of the widely used observational data sets like as a part of RCMS distribution. RCMS database has uh, yeah some key data sets. For example, precipitation data from NASA's uh, tropical rainfall measuring mission and temperature and precipitation from a British like climate research unit. Uh, and we also provide evaporation, precipitation, and snow water equivalent data sets uh, from NASA's real analysis product. Okay, uh, to help your understanding of like what RCMES is, I am comparing Lawrence Livermore National Labs, the UVCDAT, and RCMES here. The two systems they are having uh, used to perform like model evaluation and both for the uh, purpose of model development and improvement or like a quantification of the uh, model uncertainty, the systems share a number of uh, common uh, computational features. For example, uh, data set loading and processing utilities uh, for different types of data sets and easy access to uh, Earth System Grid Federation and statistical analysis, the toolkit for climate data. And also like the, some uh, extens extensibility and customization like options by users. Yeah. And we also like uh, bo both like the UVC that and like RCMES are like uh, yeah, open source like uh, libraries and we try to like improve like uh, the calculation efficiency. Yeah, last spring, uh, yeah, Livermore Lab and like uh, JPL prepared and submitted uh, like a joint proposal about developing the next generation climate model evaluation system based on UVC that and RCMES. And the proposal is uh, currently under review, and I cross my fingers yeah, because I mean, yeah, creating like a synergy between these, I mean, two open source libraries, it's gonna be yeah the way to go. So uh, when you yeah, this pyramid actually explains how to use RCMES. When you first use RCMES, you might wanna run like command line interface first. This is a useful just to understand the pro general like process of climate model evaluation and the structure of RCMES. Uh, however, like the model evaluation functionality is very limited in the CLI, so RCMS provides configuration file runner for user customized model evaluation. Using configuration files, you can calculate some basic metrics and visualize them. And but yeah, there are always users who are not satisfied with, uh, I mean, some tools we provide. So for advanced users, we recommend yeah, using the uh, OCW library and like make their own yeah, toolkit or like yeah, and yeah, building their own like, model evaluation like workflow. And I'm gonna show like some examples of basic model evaluation in the following slide. Yeah, on the web, uh, these, yeah, so the, this is how the RCMS configuration file runner works. So all of, yeah, first, I mean, like, uh, to reload the data, like, up, both observation and model data and generate the data set object. And if user needs, we subset the data temporally and spatially and process the data. The process the data uh, can be saved as an independent NetCDF file for like future use, and we can calculate the I mean user designated metrics or like uh, some uh, some Beijing metrics like a bias of model or root mean square error of models and visualize the research. And all of like uh, this I mean these modulized configuration file runner is based on like uh, open climate workbench libraries. And we found that like uh, uh, the best way to attract users 
is uh, to demonstrate how users uh, can reproduce an end-to-end -end model evaluation published in journals. So by uh, visiting this website and like uh, just to follow the instructions, users can reproduce the exact same plot like uh, published in like uh, journal papers. Like we currently provide like uh, two examples. These two examples like users don't need uh, anything like uh, have any any anything like uh, before running RCMS. They just need to download the data from our website and like uh, follow the instruction and using the uh, instruction to run the configuration runner with the configuration file like uh, to generate all the figures like uh, used in these uh, two papers. And Luis already sh uh, showed uh, the website of the Apache Open Climate Workbench, and like yeah, and as he mentioned, the, we recently released uh, like a uh, uh, point one, uh, one point one, and along with I mean the Conda package. So like now the installation of the yeah, OCW is a really snap, and. Of course, like uh, if users want to see like what's going on inside the admin OCW, they can always visit our GitHub and like uh, and have like more examples. And we also have a wiki page like uh, for OCW and more user like friendly wiki page uh, can be also found on the RCMES website. And there are like uh, two ways to use RCMES. One is uh, uh, running RCMES in a virtual machine environment. Yeah, the, it is downloadable from RCMES website and it comes with all Python library and dependencies and even some data sets. So uh, regardless of like a uh, user's machine, like a PC or Linux or a Mac, users can just uh, download this uh, virtual machine image and like uh, run it uh, inside a uh, virtual box. And advanced users, like uh, if they have already have like a Python installed on their machine, they can install like OCW, like uh, using our like Conda packages or just uh, git pull the older source code from our like a GitHub repository. Okay, yeah, I think yeah, that's pretty much uh, everything uh, I want to show today. And we keep developing like uh, RCMES, and like while uh, whenever that uh, we need a new feature, like uh, we also develop the OCW to, like uh, together. So the RCMES development and OCW development are like uh, going on like in parallel. And our goal is to uh, develop uh, like a comprehensive model evaluation system. Yeah, for regional climate assessment, including like uh, the the international effort, the Cordex, and the U.S. national climate assessment. Yeah, you can find more information. Yeah, on both RCMS and OCW website, and feel free to send any email. Yeah, if you have any questions. Thank you. Hey, Kyo, thank you very much. Um, and Lewis, uh, I guess folks have to unmute themselves or let's see here, maybe I can mute, unmute. Or maybe chat me if, you, <laughs> if, you're, if you're muted by me. Um, I have, does anybody have a question? I guess I should let other people ask a question first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anything in the chat, though. Okay, so let me ask a question. Um, first, Lewis, uh, you talked mostly about the Apache Foundation, um, and you know, what would you, how would you summarize, like the, the well, I guess first of all, are there are there um, uh, hurdles that you have to pass, you know, get over to become a Apache project? I mean, I wasn't quite clear. You know, if, be, if being an Apache project, does it does it say? It sounds better to say Apache, you know, dot org. But is it? Um, what do you actually have to do differently than you know, just being some project on GitHub, um, or is it just applying and becoming a project? I think I might have to unmute you, Lewis. Hold on a second. Okay. How is that? That's me now. Yeah. 
That's me now, I think. Okay, fantastic, thanks. So, that's an excellent question, actually. That's a good question. So, essentially what happens this year is that the Patches Software Foundation itself has, has a project called the Incubator. And the Incubator itself is essentially um, an area and a, 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 a structure which is set up for projects to enter should they wish to, um, to aspire to become a top level project at the Apache Software Foundation. And the purpose of this incubating staging area and the process in which um, involves an, a, an incubation um, period is that um, if you go to the, the uh, incubator IPMC, the Incubator Project Management Committee, which is around about five or six hundred people strong, and what that you do is you would approach them with a proposal. If you go to incubator.apache.org, you'll get links to sample proposals. So say you have been funded for a project, maybe through, I don't know, NASA, AIST, or something, I don't know. Um, and this, 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 there are precedents for this happening. That OCW is one. There's various other ones at, at JPL, which, uh, various other projects which we are, we are trying to transition through the Apache Incubator. Um, Apache OODT, the Object Oriented Data Technology, is another um, project which has successfully travelled through the incubator and become a top level project. But essentially what you would do is you fill out a proposal template um, detailing what the code is, who the current community are, um, what, why you would like to try and, and create a, a sustainable and foundational model for your project moving forward. Um, you list um, you know, the, the specifics about your current software stack or your current software. And then essentially what happens is you've got a group of people, which is the Incubator Project Management Committee, that review your proposals. These are just um, people from around the world that have gained merit by participation in the foundation. And they would provide um, positive criticism or, or criticism towards a proposal with the aim of you trying to, you know, maybe amend it such that it, it defines the sustainable model for moving through with your project and trying to grow community around your project. It's not just about a name. That That's just a... Uh, that's just something else. That's an effect of having a, a suitable community around about your project. What, what it also does is the Apache Software Foundation itself as well provides services. So provides source code management. Um, I know you can get it on GitHub, but it provides a canonical source code management. If GitHub was to close tomorrow, you wouldn't have your source code there. The Apache Software Foundation canonical code resides at Apache and the source code is mirrored to GitHub. It provides a legal structure there for your project, and um, you manage contributor license agreements. This is all done under the foundational body of the Apache Software Foundation, and there's a bunch more information on that topic which can be linked to from both the incubator process, incubator.apache.org, as well as apache.org forward slash foundation, and it's got documentation there until you can go blue in the face. Okay, I get it. I get it. That's that's great. That was a great answer. And I guess one other additional thing is, I suppose the Apache organization, a foundation, gets a certain number of uh, Google Summer of Code slots, I suppose, that you can right. compete for. And that's right. quite nice. That seems quite handy as well. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, OCW benefited very well this year from that, um, as did the students. I mean, I mentored two projects for OCW, and I mentored a couple of other projects, another um, Google Summer of Code projects, which I work on in other projects. But OCW did very well this year. We've extended the data sources, which means that um, you know once we release that code and that code's stable to be released in the 1.2.0 release, we've got a whole new user base over at the Kodak, which is the oceanographers, and we can we can now be saying to them, look, this is an established toolkit with a community of users around about it, but we want to hear about some of your use cases. Here you go. Should you wish to learn how to use it, here's the documentation similar to what we've been doing today, and that that that's really that's really exciting and interesting, I think. To think that get, you know invest three months on something like that, and and you know, you know you can you can reap the benefits towards the end of the summer. So you're absolutely right about that, Rich. Yeah. Okay. And actually, actually, and just um, I'm not seeing anybody other chats, but please, other folks uh, chime in here. But because um, I have a lot of questions, but <laughs> um, is is another is there, is there another uh, aspect where uh, do you have to follow the NASA 
you know, how, how did the, the NASA.gov, you know, software requirements and everything sort of jive with, or did they just say, hey, go ahead and do this stuff at Apache, or do you have to find, do you have right. to follow all the uh, NASA.gov um, yeah. various rules for software release and everything as well? But, yep, that's a, that's a very good question, and it's very relevant, particularly for the for the, the participants on, on this call, and it's something that I need to be quite honest with you, I think has been going through the works for about, I would say about a decade, maybe five to ten years at JPL. It's taken a long time to get to where we are just now, but essentially what it comes down to is um, for new technology reporting at uh, JPL, you, 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 you would register an NTR, it's an, a document which says basically a description of, of the, the new technology and what you propose to do with it and what we would say is that we would like to release the source code, it's, it's beneficial to the organisation which is at that point is JPL Caltech, it's beneficial to the organisation for us to open source this code because we're trying to build community and sustainability around about the code. That goes through a process which is um, has been simplified greatly due to input from a number of folk at JPL, but um, essentially what then happens is that you know you can license that code permissively. We, su we suggest if, if you would think about maybe trying to go into a foundational structure such as the Apache Software Foundation or something like the Eclipse Foundation or some other foundational body, if that's the, the route that you decide to go, um, then once your code's open source, then that's when you would begin to put to work together an incubation proposal to try and move it towards you know, exceptions into the Apache incubator and for the incubation um, period to begin, basically. But I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, to you here. It's, it has been quite a, um, it's been quite a, a um, intense process over quite a long time to try and get it through to where we are just now, where people are beginning to realise more that, and especially funders for the, a lot of these projects are starting to think that you know we want the project to last after. The funding period. I mean, that's that part of the proposal writing process. I mean, what's going to happen to your code base after our funding to you um, essentially finishes after year two or year three or year five or whatever? And and moving your code into a foundational um, arena, I think, is a much much more sustainably sensible um, mechanism for for improving the overall um, appeal of of proposals. But also for the code base itself and the people that might end up adopting that code at some point of view. You can't just abandon all your users after year two or year three. So I think it makes much more sense to try and to try and move towards that. It should be said as well that at JPL in particular, um, there's a number of us that are involved in. I know, I know a lot of people, a lot of places are involved in open source. But if anybody on the call um, is interested in, in obtaining further guidance, particularly on this topic and some of the hurdles. That, that we've encountered and we've managed to address at JPL, then by all means, please please reach out to myself and you know some of my colleagues at JPL um, were, were kind of tenured in this kind of stuff now, and, and we've been more than happy to try and provide you know guidance on on how we did it and potentially how you could adapt, adapt that for your own purposes. Okay. So um, I want to make sure that nobody else has any uh, questions. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? I have some questions for Kyo, but I'm going to hold off for a second. <laughs> OK, either I have, like, have everybody <laughs> muted and they don't know how to talk, or uh, hopefully the people can chat and uh, tell me if, I've, you know, if they're trying to say something. Um, so in terms of the data model, um, you know, you, you did mention UVCDAT there, and uh, I guess the you know, and I think of the we, we use the climate forecast conventions a lot as um, mm -hmm. as a common data model for our um, oceanographic data sets and our hydrologic data sets, and um, you know our MET uh, stuff. And uh, so we you know we have curvilinear grids, we have stretched vertical coordinates that we uh, use CF to take advantage of when we're working with data models in Python. Um, and I, and so I'm wondering if you didn't say much about the data model, except that there's a data set concept. And I'm wondering if it does it include the CF conventions? Can you put in a curvilinear grid, or does it work only with data that has one-dimensional latitude and longitude coordinates, for instance? Uh, it just uh, works like uh, well with the curvilinear grids because most of RCMs use curvilinear grids, but 
we don't really handle the I mean some irregular trees you know just uh, there is a like a one array of like all coordinate and like a data thing like uh, we don't really handle it well like uh, mostly some observation data but curvilinear grids it yeah it's working well like uh, with RCMES. So so I could have a you know like an annular you know some kind of annular grid or something and it would be okay uh, you could regrid yeah. from that yeah okay yeah yeah yeah, as long as I mean, like, uh, yeah, the, I mean, all the, I mean, you know, names like follow the CAP convention. I think we can handle pretty much every uh, data set. And so the C, I mean, I think of the CF names as one aspect of CF, and then the CF data model as the other, you know, and sort of almost separate concepts that are both fall mm -hmm. under the CF umbrella. But it's more the data model that. I, so you're saying it does support the CF data model? Oh, like, like it, not, not as. But not as well as like UVC that yeah that's I think uh, that's really I mean big advantage of like a UVC that like uh, okay. kind of yeah yeah applicable to like a to a more variety of data sets and okay so that's maybe the, some of the work that could be when you guys um, if you're successful in this proposal that will be um, you'll be able to sort of integrate uh, that functionality into the OCW I guess and. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like yeah. uh, the the proposed. I mean, uh, the proposal is. I mean, suggesting. I mean, like a new next generation the system, like uh, based on mainly based on like a UVC app, but yeah, bringing like uh, some user friendly like a uh, workflow, like a uh, implementation from RCMES, and so yeah, I hope yeah we can get some funding to work on that. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, um, I think that was a very interesting talk. I uh, actually the uh, I found the uh, the Apache uh, Foundation stuff is equally interesting as the actual technology. So, so that was uh, no, maybe because it was something completely. I don't think many people on this call probably were aware of. Um, uh, the, what the Apache Foundation did to that degree. So that was I, I, I was I was thinking that I, I I hope that you know I didn't want to go in too deep on that stuff, but I hope that I know the background of that people struggle with in terms of making sustainable software in, in the science community, and I think that I just wanted to provide an overview on that. So hopefully you know that that's done that. So if you if one person in the call is taking something away from it, then then it's great. That's basically yeah. it. Yeah, that, no, it's, that was that was very interesting, and, and definitely we'll think about that for some of our projects that we do want to be um, are trying to figure out how to keep you know sustain into the future yeah. beyond the the next funding cycle. So, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, guys, um, if there's no other, we have a quite a quiet uh, group today, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to give one last chance to anybody to ask a uh, question. Uh, I have a question. Actually. I've got a quick question. Sure. Um, and it's Lewis. Are you so the, the, today's session is recorded? I wonder is the session, the recording available through the wiki page? Yes. The yes. Right. So after this call, I will convert it into a uh, uh, and and upload it to YouTube, and then link the um, and then put in the link there on the wiki page. So it will be Fantastic. discoverable just through just through YouTube search, but also through the wiki page. Oh, yeah. that's excellent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks very much. All right, well, guys, thank you very much. Uh, that was a, that was a really interesting talk, and um, and just a reminder: next time again, we'll, we're going to hear about something a little different: um, the EarthCube integration and test environment from Phil Yang at uh, George Mason. All right, thanks everybody. See you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye.